In studio with us is Eric Holm, who is the activities director at Truman High School. You also coached football at Truman State University in Kirksville. So thanks for coming in studio. Thanks for having me. Tell us, to my knowledge, there are no high schools in the area that have canceled their football programs. But do the numbers, what do the numbers say to you? The numbers say that a lot of people have to evaluate that. Um, not only at the varsity level, but at sub-varsity levels, freshmen, uh, JV, you get into a situation where uh, people are hurt or there's, the numbers aren't there. You have to decide whether you're going to put somebody out there or not. I think everybody's wrestling with that, that problem. Is the game getting, is, is the game not safe enough? Are there ways to make the game safer without canceling school programs? Uh, that, that's the, you know, $64,000 question, right? I mean, uh, uh, technology and equipment is better than it's ever been, but yet there's a lot more awareness as well. So everybody's struggling with those issues of uh, safety, equipment, uh, and yet the knowledge we have about what the long-range effects might be. The thing about football is that if it's safe, it's not fun to watch. I mean, that's, that's the unfortunate thing is that without plays that cause injuries like this, um, millions of Americans aren't tuning in every Sunday. I think that's a little bit of an unfortunate thing. Uh, you know, as an old football coach, and old football player myself, obviously I see a lot of beauty in the game, and I don't think it's all just about the contact. But obviously that, that gladiator mentality exists, and there's no question about it. And there's a certain amount of physicalness that has to take place to make the game work. But uh, like I said, I see beauty in, in the game as a whole. But uh, the, the gladiator coliseum part, I understand perfectly. Can you tell the story about what happened while you were a coach with a player? We were talking about players passing away, and, and I had one myself as a head coach on the field, the fourth game of my college career. Um, this was what would be considered an indirect injury, uh, idiopathic hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which I learned a lot about. That's the Hank Gathers thing, the thing that the enlarged mm -hmm. heart that uh, Hank Gathers uh, passed away from. And we had a player, Darren Jercade, uh, from Waynesville, Missouri, playing for me at Northeast Missouri State in those days. Uh, now Truman State, and uh, he had that problem on the field during a game. Um, that's something that stays with you. Uh, that happened 25 years ago. Uh, I had one of the players from that team call me just last week because it was the anniversary. Uh, when you have something like that happen right in front of you, you become very aware. Not that we weren't already, and you're not very sensitive to what could happen. But I know in my case over my, my career now, uh, having witnessed that and been a part of that and been there with his father when they told him that he wasn't going to make it, that, that just stays with you. And so I know for us and the programs that I've been associated with, and I think with most coaches, they're, they're very cognizant and very aware of safety. But uh, to have something like that uh, happen right in front of you definitely uh, reminds you of what could happen. Did you make changes after that? Did you then evaluate the program to try to figure out if there were things that should be done differently? We did. And, you know, in this case, because it wasn't necessarily from a blow, but we didn't know that at the time. So we had to do all that research. And is it drug-related? Is there something else? Uh, what are the causes? What, what caused this and how could we prevent it? And so we did take a look at those things. As we found out, it was a congenital thing that no one could do anything mm -hmm. about. But we didn't know that at the time, and so we, there was a lot of soul-searching for days and weeks, and, and, uh, and honestly, some accusations and things from different people saying, well, it must have been a drug thing, or it must have been a blow to the head. In this case, it wasn't, but, but certainly it could have been. So I think that for us, but as you know, um, you know at the college uh, and pro and high school level, we're all taking steps these days to try to be as cognizant as we can and try to make the game as safe as we can. And, and as the report indicated. I mean, the numbers are dropping. And, uh, you know, some of it is for the right, the right reason. Some of it is a PR thing. And what are you going to do to salvage the game? Now, have you actually seen a, a student who was interested in going out for the football team being prevented by a parent? Absolutely. Um, I think it happens in just about every high school these days. And sometimes we have discussions about it. Uh, it's not one of those things that you're really going to jump up and down too much about. You know, you try to have enough information out there and try to explain things. But there's no question that that's happening locally and it's happening across the nation. And w when they come to, uh, if, if you've directly interacted with these parents, are they filled with good information or is it unfounded fear? Um, sometimes both. You know, uh, I think a lot of times they are people who are very educated about it and have, and have seen the numbers and gosh the numbers kind of jump out at you sometimes um, but also there are things that happen and sometimes they're unique and so I, I've, I've seen both I've seen some of it just a reaction to publicity I've seen others that it's their decision based on the information at hand uh, so we all are dealing with that in some form or fashion so if a, a concerned parent comes to you what 
is your role in that conversation? Uh, my, my role is to, is to give them the information to provide you know, the things that we do, the, our own experiences, uh, the protocols that are in place. Uh, to protect kids, and obviously, you know, whether it be my our own children or we treat their children as our own, you know, what we're doing to protect them. But uh, you know, in my estimation, it's not our uh, um, responsibility to uh, dissuade them, or, or you know, it's their decision. Um, and and as you know, more and more people and kids and parents are making that decision not to play. The kids who are steering away from football, what are they getting into instead? Um, you know, the, some of them are other sports, some of them not. I, I, what I have found more is the, the day of the multi-sport athlete is dwindling. And, and that's true. I know a lot of schools are doing things to kind of promote that. They're giving awards and things to kids who participate in two or three sports. I don't find that they're necessarily jumping to a fall sport. Some of them do. Uh, they mentioned soccer earlier. Since soccer, uh, boys soccer is played in the fall, sometimes football, that is one. What I find more is they're just concentrating on baseball. They're just concentrating on basketball. They're, that's a whole other story, too, about the multi-sport athlete. But I think with football in particular, that's what we're finding. They're just saying, I'm just going to concentrate on baseball. All right. So coming up next, uh, I want you to address a couple of texts that we, we got coming in. The numbers say we need to stop raising pansies. And wow, the total wussification of America. Zach and Jamie, it's Trent Casey talking about the issue of high school football. Three deaths in the past month directly due to on-field hits. Uh, another student paralyzed from the waist down. Uh, and it's causing high schools in different pockets of the country to actually cancel their programs. And also participation is down. It's down 25,000 over the past five years. Students are finding other things to do. Parents are preventing their kids from playing football because the perception is, and there's a lot to justify this perception, is that it's too dangerous. Uh, so we have Eric Holm, Activities Director at Truman High School, former head coach at Truman State, in studio with us. Uh, a man who has lived his life uh, with football alongside him. I mean, you've been a coach, you've been a player, and there were a couple of texts that I wanted to you to address, and we get these every time we bring up this issue. The numbers say we need to stop raising pansies, and wow, the total wussification of America. How do you respond to people whose, <laughs> whose line of thought is, is like that? I, I understand it. Um, that being said, as you said, I've been around the game all my life, and I do believe it's a beautiful game. Uh, there are things that we can do and are doing to make the game safer. Uh, inevitably, there, when you put 22 kids or 22 men or people out there, uh, no matter training, education, equipment, they're going to get into some awkward positions and there, are, there is a chance for things to happen. But um, there is much more education, there is much more uh, certification, uh, there are much more, many more protocols in place now to try to protect kids as much as possible. Um, it's a great game, and I don't want to see it go away either. You know, I just hope that we can be open-minded to keep improving the game. I, I think it's one of the things uh, we see uh, in high school and college in particular, the, the advent of this spread game. It's a different style. We're not smash mouth. You know, we still, those, even those terms have kind of gone away for coaches, smash mouth and whatever. Maybe we shouldn't talk that way, but spreading the game out, more one-on-one, -on -one, more open field stuff, uh, it makes the game safer. We don't have uh, 22 guys up really close to the line of scrimmage all butting heads all the time. They're still, that's still part of the game. It's going to be part of the game. But uh, education, uh, fundamentals, teaching, certification, those kind of things, we can do things to make the game safer. How do you convince your players, though, who in part are playing football? My dad played high school football. Big guy. And, and want, they want to hit. They want, that's partly why they're playing is for that impact part of the game. How do you convince them and coach them differently so that they don't? Well, well again, there's still plenty of impact and, and contact that can occur legally and safely. And that's really the key. You know, not putting yourself or putting anybody else in an awkward position, where your head goes, where your shoulders go, that's always been part of the game. Uh, we, we know that uh, certain head-to-head -head and head-to-parts uh, per of other people's body contact is going to create issues. So you're really just trying to, to create um, more awareness, better education, better teaching, better coaching on wh where that head goes, because that's really the key thing. Um, and everything else that happens with the game with shoulders and those kind of things, that, that's going to happen. And there's going to be contact, and it is part of the game, but it can be done safely.
It's, it's part of the issue, and this is a, a question off of the text line, is that players now are just bigger, stronger, and faster than they ever were before. There's, there's no question there is an element of that. I mean, I'm thinking about uh, Jimmy Graham or Travis Kelsey, tight ends who are 6'7", six, six, seven. Seven, mm -hmm. 270. Those guys were big offensive. They're bigger than probably anybody on the offensive line was for the Kansas City Chiefs in Super Bowl One, And now these guys are running around in the open field with a ball, and you've got to tackle them. Uh, Marshawn Lynch. I, I can't imagine trying to tackle Marshawn Lynch. Uh, you know, so you have those kind of guys and their ability and their body types. And, and there's no question the human body can only sustain so much. And, and uh, now we're talking about the NFL level, but that it's all relative as you go down through the college and, and high school ranks and weight training and, and nutrition and all those things. There's no question people are bigger, faster, stronger than they ever were. Does ne Do networks like ESPN bear some responsibility here? And, because you look at their top 10 highlights, you know, after a Sunday of football has completed. And inevitably, five of them are going to be just vicious hits. And then so kids see that and that they equate it with success. It, it may be the wussification of me, but I, I honestly, I totally agree. You know, the glorification of certain types of hits uh, does lend and feed into this whole whole mentality. Uh, again, the game is a beautiful game. It's the physical part of it is part of it. It can't go away. It's crucial. It's the this the basic element. But but hits that maim, hits that injure, hits that create you know lifelong problems for the the person doing it or the person that they're hitting. We we can do without that. You know, Peyton Manning throwing a long touchdown pass is just as beautiful as as somebody making contact somewhere. And uh, so that that's the question that everybody's struggling with. And it's hard to imagine programs going away. I mean, it's such, I grew up in a small town where this is what we did on Friday night. Even if you didn't love football, that's where we all hang out. The entire community turns out to that. It's a part of our community in a way that a lot of sports are not. I mean, Friday Night Lights is one of my favorite shows There's of all time. There's a reason it was so popular. We, we are having our first homecoming game ever at Truman tomorrow night. 51 years, we've never had our own field. We're expecting 10,000 people. I've wow. written articles and, and, and letters to parents recently about Friday Night Lights. There's books written about it. There's movies made about it. We glorify that. And, there, and there's a reason, you know, for that. Um, but we also know that in certain situations, as the numbers have dwindled for right or wrong reasons, as you get down to uh, the numbers uh, 14, 12, 18, I don't know what that minimum number is, it, you really do put the kids at risk. One of the things in looking at injuries is just how many opportunities a kid has to have an injury. Is he playing 50 plays? Is he playing 100 mm -hmm. plays? A kid on a team that has 14 players, they're out there. Every single play, offense, defense, special teams, and and yes, we did some of that when we were all younger. But but uh, the the life life is different. Think the game has changed, and you have to make that determination that maybe it's unsafe for those kids to be out there uh, against a team that's running 50, 60 players out there with fresh players, bigger players, stronger players. You have to determine what's best for your kids and the program. Let me ask you about the helmets. Now, have you seen any alternatives? You know, just to the actual structure of the helmet that could possibly protect the head better? Absolutely. and But there is a little bit of a misnomer there, and, and I'm not a medical doctor, and I don't want to uh, say the wrong thing here, but it's just like a motorcycle helmet, right? If you land a certain way, the motorcycle helmet isn't necessarily going to protect you from everything. And we found that with concussions, it's the brain being tossed around inside the cranium. So some people might even say that, that improved helmets make people somewhat feel invulnerable, and there's going to be this contact. And no matter what, that as that brain gets tossed around in the cranium, no matter how good the helmet is, in fact, if the helmet's really good, maybe I stick my head in there a little bit more, then you're going to cause this trauma to the brain. You mentioned uh, about getting your bell rung. Getting your bell rung is trauma to the brain. It may not be the medical term of concussion, but there is trauma that has occurred. It's a brain injury. It, it's a brain injury of some sort, whatever degree that is. So anytime that happens, you're at risk. And helmets, um, they are, there's, they, it's the highest level of technology we could possibly have. There are also helmets now out that have sensors in them that can actually determine mm -hmm. when kids have had a major hit that would oh, wow. or might yeah. cause a concussion. Some people are, are afraid to use those because they don't want to know. Yeah. And, and I've had I've talked to coaches say I don't want my kids to have them because then they're not going to play and that because we're going to find out of a program yeah. in one year with exactly. all that data. It's this conundrum with those things and and I, I understand, you know, you understand on some level that that argument, mm -hmm. but still 
protecting kids. I mean, that's our job. I don't, whatever coach or administrator you are, your job is to protect kids. As I say, I go, I go back to I love the game. I played the game, played it at a high level, coached at a high level. I want to see it continue. But we, we can't just turn an, our back to it or turn a blind eye to it. We have to find a way to, to overcome these obstacles if we want the game to continue. Final question real quick. Um, if you had a young kid who wanted to play football today, would you hesitate before allowing him? Uh, I, I would not. Um, I, and again, I'm just saying from my own perspective, I was one of those lucky ones. I, I never had a concussion. And, and maybe, maybe if I had had or maybe I'd had several or had some other uh, residual issue, maybe I might feel differently about it. But I've, th just the vast majority of kids haven't. The, the benefits from the game, um, I think, are extraordinary. Um, so, and we've talked about it. I have I have a, three children. They're all grown. One uh, uh, played football for a short period of time. He just didn't like playing. Mm -hmm. um, but we didn't prevent him from playing, and the injury was not not a factor. But um, I, I would not I would not prevent them. But uh, obviously, um, we would want to have uh, as much of a talk about the, the different possibilities as we could. Eric Holm, uh, activities director at Truman High School, former head coach at Truman State. Thank you so much for your uh, for your time today. Thanks for having me.